Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs and today we're going to be talking about the Kelvin scale and thinking about temperature. Okay, so in the recent activity you've been, we've been looking at um, comparing properties of gases. We've been um, thinking about pressure, which we give the symbol of P, volume, which is V, temperature, which is T, and number of particles, which we call N. And so we were looking at some of the relationships that exist between these properties. Okay, so that we saw that when we created a graph of volume versus pressure, that we saw this sort of relationship, what we call a hyperbola. Over here, what we saw um, with pressure versus the number of particles was that we saw this sort of a relationship. Okay, um, we would say that this is a proportional or a directly proportional um, relationship. So this is a hyperbola of the actual shape of the line and we introduce this idea that it, it is inversely proportional. As one goes up, the other goes down. Okay, so we said P is proportional to 1 over V. P is proportional to the number of particles. And then we introduced an interesting sort of relationship over here, which was looking at the temperature in Celsius and our pressure. And we saw this kind of a relationship. Okay, so it was linear, but it was not proportional. Okay, now when we were saying linear, not proportional, linear, it's a straight line. But what we're seeing is that it, um, if we doubled the temperature in Celsius, we didn't double the pressure. If we double the number of particles, we double the pressure. So that's why we say it's proportional. That exactly what we do to one, we do to the other. Whereas linear, so it's more of our y equals mx plus b kind of line. Okay? And so what that what we're going to explore in this is, is a little bit more about how this works. You know, so in the previous video, so we actually I tried to identify, okay, well, what's happening to explain why um, with the general trends that we're identifying here. But now we're going to dig into this one a little further. Okay, I kept you in suspense in the previous video and I promised that I said in this next one that we go into it further. Okay, so uh, what I want to do is set it up like this. Okay, so we saw this sort of relationship. So we saw a temperature in Celsius and pressure. And so what we saw is that as so that that as um, as T increased, so as the temperature increased, the pressure increased. As temperature decreased, pressure also decreased. Okay, so this is so we saw you know that that kind of helps to account for a line that looks like this. But now this you know so we had you know maybe 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. Okay, that sort of kind of pattern going along here. But then what we saw is that. In the previous graph where we had um, number of particles versus pressure, that zero particles equals zero pressure. Okay, which makes sense as far as when we define pressure in terms of collisions of the particles with their container, it, it's logical that if there's no particles that there should be no pressure. Okay, so that's why our line goes to zero and zero. But here our line is not zero, zero. We have a y-intercept. Okay, and then that's that's quite in, in, it can be intuitive in a, in a way as far as saying all right, when the temperature is at zero Celsius, like inside a freezer, for example, which is well, it's actually a bit colder than that, but you know, if we were at that zero Celsius, and we had a gas at that temperature, would the particles of that gas be pushing on, still pushing on the container? And the intuitive answer for us is yes, it would. That gas still takes up space. It's not turned into a liquid. It's not stopped do behaving altogether. We recognise that we have. Up at some sort of a pressure at that point. The other thing that's intuitive about it is that especially if you've lived somewhere colder in your life or you've gone to the snow or you've visited somewhere cold, we can recognize that this scale does not stop here. Celsius is a scale that continues into the negative territory. Okay, and so we could get minus 20, uh, minus 40, minus 60. You know, we could keep our scale going and, you know, extend it all the way in the negative direction. We can keep just saying, all right, well, what, what if we had temperatures of that, that kind of magnitude? Um, and what might we notice? 
you know, so I mean, I, when I was a kid, I lived in Canada, you know, quite regularly in the depths of winter, it would be minus 20 or, or below during the day, minus 30 or below at night. Um, you know, so their houses are kind of accommodate for that, but we, we, we know that these sort of temperatures exist. So then you can look at a graph like this and you can set up your axes like this and you can keep, keep extending it out to the left. And then we can just say, well, well, what if we go to minus 20? What might we expect? Okay, and so we might expect a, a pressure that's around about here at minus 40. What do we expect? At minus 60, what do we expect? And you can see that as we go, that it's logical that we take this line and we continue to extend it backwards. Okay, and then to say, all right, well, eventually we will get to a point at which the particles will not be pushing on the container anymore. That is, eventually we will get to a zero pressure. So then the question becomes, okay, well, how cold do we have to get before that happens? Okay, and so if we keep taking this graph and we keep going further, all right, let's, let's see if I can kind of redraw it on a, on a bigger sort of scale here in thinking about, okay, you know, so if we have, say, you know, say we've got zero, say we've got 100, say we've got minus 100, say we've got minus 200, okay, and then we continue all the way out to, to minus 300. All right, so what we notice, I realise that's right on the edge of the video, apologies, but okay, so if we, if we kind of, we notice this sort of a behaviour for our line, um, is that we can keep extending it further and further back, all the way down and bang. Sorry if my line kind of slopes off a little bit there, kind of qualifies with the rubbishness of my drawings. Okay, so we get to this point, somewhere around about a value of minus 273 degrees Celsius is where we get pressure of zero. Okay, so if we can, if we can take our line that's accurately measured and then we can, we say, extrapolate the t that, that line all the way down to where it hits the x-axis, where it hits pressure equals zero, then that corresponds to a temperature of minus 273. But so then what we do is that we have now then take this idea as, all right, well, let's imagine that instead of having, you know, all these minus numbers over here, let's reset the zero. Let's say let's have a point at which we have a temperature of zero. Now that corresponds to zero particle movement. It corresponds to zero pressure, where there's no interaction of the particles with their container. That's the lowest that it can go. That is the coldest that something can be. That is the slowest its particles can move. They can't move any slower than a stop. Okay, and so then let's make our scale move up from here. Okay, so we start at zero and then we move our way up. And we say, this is the Kelvin scale of temperature. Okay, and so that is zero Kelvin. So it has the, the, a symbol of capital K as its units. It's not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. Corresponds to, or is the same as, minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, to be precise. Okay, so at zero Kelvin was that. But now here's one of the reasons that we like using this scale is that the magnitude of one Kelvin is the same as one degree Celsius. Okay, so unlike the Fahrenheit scale, which the wacky Americans use, that where one degree Fahrenheit is not the same as one, um, you know, so one degree Fahrenheit is not the same as one degree Celsius, okay, which makes it a pain in the neck, especially if you're um, dealing with, with um, people who are constantly talking in, in Fahrenheit temperatures. Okay, but so that means that for every one, for every one Kelvin we go up, it would be the same as going up one Celsius. Okay, so 1 Kelvin would be minus 272.15 and so on. Okay, so that means that for our purposes, when we do calculations, when we do things involving gases, we are going to be working with te temperatures in Kelvin. Now, part of the reason for that is not just because we just decide to set a new standard, but that when we have temperatures in Kelvin, that pressure is directly proportional to temperature. Okay, so where it wasn't before, where we had only this section before and we couldn't say doubling the Celsius equals doubling the pressure, now that if we take, um, you know, if we take our temperatures in Kelvin, so, you know, if we say, all right, at 100 Kelvin, let's call it um, a pressure of X. Okay, that that means at 200 Kelvin, that we have a pressure of 2X. At 300 Kelvin, that is three times our original pressure, we have 3X. At 50 Kelvin, we would have half X and so on. 
so that we see that they're now proportional. And so now we can see, right, well, as we double the temperature in Kelvin, we double the pressure. As we halve the temperature in Kelvin, we halve the pressure. So instead of a weird kind of semi-linear relationship, we now have a proportional one with numbers we can use in our calculations. Okay, this, and now this uh, video is kind of joke. Rather than a, a joke telling you out loud, I'm going to show you a meme. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.